Good morning. So I'm here with a very simple premise, and that is that anyone can make amazing things. And if anyone can make amazing things, then that means you can make amazing things. And so what I need you to do is I need you to think of an amazing thing that you want to make. Now maybe this is something that you were inspired to make years ago, or maybe it's something that you were inspired to make while sitting here this morning. Either way, it doesn't matter. Got your thing? Then I want you to think about your motivation for building it. Now, maybe your motivation is accolades, awards, you want to win a grand challenge or a prize. Maybe your motivation is financial, you want to seek financial independence. Or perhaps you've got a project, an experiment that's really exciting and you want to get it to space. Or perhaps you've got an idea that if it was built could actually help save the planet. And that motivation is important because as we talked about earlier, too many ideas stop right here. Because what happens is, as you start to share that idea with others and you start to hear those criticisms, we talked a little bit about that earlier, you're going to find out that you don't have the skills, the tools, and the resources necessary to bring that idea to life. But I'm here to tell you that you can bring that idea to life, but you need a good approach that's going to help you. So I had the good fortune a couple years ago to hear Dr. Clay Christensen speak. He's an author. He wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. He's a professor at Harvard Business School. And what he talked about was how in times of resource scarcity, times of austerity, I heard lots of comments about budgets earlier today, that the people who control those resources are financial and business people. And they're trained to look for past performance for making future investment decisions. And so what you have to do when you're thinking truly new and truly innovative is actually take part of that idea from the future and do just a piece of it so that you can prove to them that it will work and you can give them a little data that they can put in their spreadsheet and then prove that your idea will work. Now prototyping is not new. We talked about it a little bit today, right? You come up with an idea, you see how it's going to work, you get some data on it. Now, who am I to sit here and talk to you about prototyping today? Well, I'm really just the kid who always took apart his toys. I suspect many of you were the same. I remember one Christmas, I got a remote control car, we charged up the batteries, I took it out, we ran it up and down the street, it came back, I was bored. I had a screwdriver though, and that car never worked again. <laughs> so my parents weren't too crazy about this vocation, but eventually I got a little better at it until one day I fixed the family TV. Suddenly your value, your points rise just a little bit when you make that happen. And then I got into the workforce, and when I was in the workforce, I kind of did the same thing. I started out with software and I learned how to take systems and learn how they work and make them better or write wholly new systems. And when you do that long enough and you start moving from working on systems to working on processes and products and organizations, they give it a really cool name called innovation. They don't put that on your business cards generally and it's probably a good thing. But the good news about innovation is it sort of implies experimentation, trying something, seeing if it'll work. Sometimes it works, when it does, you do a lot more of that. When it doesn't work, you stop. And again, that's all prototyping. Now along the way, I've always been happy to do this in the workforce, but I still like taking apart the toys on the weekend and having fun. And that's where my personal passion comes in. And I had two sons. And well, I came up with this name of this website, Raising Geeks. And turns out they like it too. And what we do is we take apart things and build new things on the weekends. In fact, right now we're taking a 1976 pinball machine. We ripped out all the electronics that didn't work, and we're building an entirely new pinball machine with high def video and high def sound, right? And that's a lot of fun. But I bring up my boys for a different point. The reason I bring them up is that one of my best lessons in innovation and prototyping actually came from my son when he was 11. I took him to an event called Maker Fair. Now, in this case, I took him to the Bay Area Maker Fair near San Francisco. About 120,000 people get together over a weekend. It's this really cool combination of a science fair and a county fair put together. Not much of it has any actual reason, but it's all really cool. And so after walking around for that, that first day, 
my son, who's 11 at the time, looks at me and he says, hey, dad, you know what I figured out? I'm like, hey, buddy, what? He said, ordinary people can make amazing things. And I thought, wow, what an epiphany at that age to realize that you don't have to have unlimited funding. You don't have to have a lab. You don't have to be part of a major university to go actually build something amazing. We were walking around looking at people just like you and me that had built really cool things. Now, the fun part about addressing this crowd is you're not ordinary. You work for an amazing, amazing institution that's inspired people for generations. So if ordinary people can build amazing things, imagine what you can build. So we've talked about your idea. We've talked about your motivation. And hopefully I've convinced you that anyone can build a great prototype. So what's next? Well, the good news in building that prototype is that the skills are readily available. The tools are better than ever. And I want to take you few, a few, a few, a through of those, through a few of those, <laughs> and show you what they are. And I've suddenly lost slide advance. If someone could push that button for me, I'd appreciate it. It's on. I will reboot it. Rebuild it, Ryan. Ooh, that's a new button. Where's the frog? Dude, come back. So what this slide would tell you about, and it's a really great graphic. I spent a lot of time building it. Um, when you want to build things today, please, sir. It's not the clicker. It's me, apparently. Um, so what I'd be telling you about is when I build things, when I come up with ideas and I want to build a prototype, most often they involve a computer or electronics of some fashion. So you know whether you need a sensor or you need to communicate with the network or you need to light lights or move a motor. And there's three really, really great computing platforms that are right there now. And they're all the size of a credit card, an actual size credit card, not that one. Um, on the left is the Arduino, the middle is the Raspberry Pi, and the right is the BeagleBone. Who here's heard of one of those platforms? Wow, this is an awesome crowd. Um, so these are really little computers, and they actually make versions of them that are even smaller. They're all less than $50. And so when you want a prototype, you want to build a new circuit, you want to try something new, they all exist, and they can really give you a great jump start. The Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone even have high def video and sound. That pinball machine I'm telling you about uses a combination of Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Now, when I build a prototype, I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm not an electrical engineer by trade. It usually ends up looking like this mess. And that's because I start by learning some small piece of it, and I figure out how it works. And then I keep building, and I'm asking questions, and I'm building more and building more but it's not pretty. And so then I say, wait, it works, but I want it to look better, or I want it to function better. And so I iterate, and I build the next version. When I build that, it gets a little better, until eventually I'm ready to say, hey, what if I wanted to almost do this professionally? What would it look like? So this is a great example of a, of a tool. There's a, there's a hobbyist version of it for free. It's called CADSoft Eagle. If you want to build a bigger board, you can do it. Uh, you can buy their professional version. So I had a great friend who helped me take that prior circuit and rebuild it in this tool. And what's great about this tool is now I can actually send this design to a PCB manufacturing facility in China and receive boards back. But again, I'm prototyping. I don't need a hundred of them. So what do I do? I actually order from a company called OSH Park. And what they do is they batch everybody who's prototyping. They take all of our design files, and they get them all together, and they do one order, and they ship it back to me. And what's great is, again, remember, we're, we're on our budgets, right? We're not on those unlimited budgets. For $62, and in two weeks' time, these boards arrive, professionally made. Pretty cool. So maybe you want to build a mechanical thing. Maybe you've got an enclosure or a bracket or a part or something. You know, there's a free piece of software now called DraftSite. CAD software used to cost you thousands of dollars. It was a barrier to entry. Now you can get a free piece of software, design that bracket, output what's called G-code, take it to a desktop CNC mill, bam, you've got a bracket. Maybe you need one, maybe you need five, maybe you need 50. It's a repeatable way to do it. 
or you take the design, you see how it works, you go back and tweak the part, and you iterate again. Maybe you want to work with 3D parts. This is a very complex 3D model that was actually derived uh, in a program called OpenSCAD, which lets those of you who like to code, you can actually write code and say, I want a sphere here, I want a, a, a cube here, and I want to intersect them in a certain way. Now this specific part was actually prototyped, printed on a 3D printer, and used within a weekend by someone I know. Uh, it's a very complex part that fixes his dishwasher rack. But the point is, if you can use these tools for a simple weekend repair at home, imagine what you can do with your big idea and a little bit more time. Now, the tools are also changing at a very rapid pace. You've got CNC routers. Used to be you'd get a big sheet of wood, you'd walk it all over to the CNC router, you'd set it down, and if you weren't near the CNC router, well, you needed to go find it. Well, ShopBot recently has come out with a new tool called the HandyBot. And the HandyBot, the idea is it's a CNC router, and you take it to where the job site is. You take it to where the material is, and you queue up the cut file right on your mobile app. So you're not talking about a giant table in a whole room with a dedicated computer. You can actually take the work, take the tool right to where the work is. And while this is great, I'm showing you lots of tools, and I'm telling you that they're cheaper and better than ever, you're probably like, how the hell am I going to learn all of this, right? There's a lot there. The good news is that's where communities come in, and there are some great communities out there. Whether it's the open source and open hardware communities, where people will learn and then publish their full source code or their full hardware files, that you can say, wait, I need to build something similar. You can take their files, see how they did it, redo it for yourself, and then the hope is that you'll publish it back to the community, and your learning will go into making the community better. But sometimes when we're learning something new, we actually need a human being near us, right? We like the collaborative space that helps us learn and talk and work with other people. And that's where hackerspaces come in. Now, what's really awesome is that hackerspace is actually now in the Oxford Dictionary as of August, as a place in which people with an interest in computing or technology can gather to work on projects while sharing ideas, equipment, and knowledge. If you've got to make something, that sounds like a pretty cool place to be, right? I want to talk about two that are in the local area. The first is Famalab. I've been a member, member of Famalab since 2011. It was actually formed in 2009. And we've got a 4,000 square foot workshop with many of the tools and technologies that I've talked about. But our mission is more than to be just a place. Our mission is to be a community that fosters learning and creativity through hands-on projects, collaboration, and the sharing of skills and tools to improve ourselves and enrich the world around us. Again, a really great place to be if you're trying to take your idea and bring it to life. But we don't just hang out in the lab. We get out there and we teach. Uh, this is uh, my, one of my partners on Orlando Mini Maker Fair, Dave Casey. We're at the Orlando Science Center. That's an Arduino. He's just taught this young gentleman how to blink an LED for the first time. You're never too young to learn this stuff. We've taught kids at age four to solder. And to see them have the connection of, wow, I can do this. I can make this thing. This kid now gets that he can make things. We also, as I mentioned, we produce Orlando Mini Maker Fair. We've spoken at events like Bar Camp. Uh, we also often form competition teams. Uh, so this is the group that won the local chapter for the International Space Apps Challenge. A couple of them are here. You've also got a, ma uh, a makerspace forming right now in Melbourne, which is very, very awesome. Uh, you know, we'd talked to the Melbourne folks for quite a while, and they participated in sometimes coming to Orlando and sometimes working in meetups in the local group. And finally this year, a, a couple just really dedicated people said, we're going to make this happen. We're going to cause this community to form right here in Melbourne. And that's an awesome thing. I'm really proud of what they're doing there. They've already got a space. They're already teaching classes. Uh, they just got their first laser cutter. So really great bunch of people uh, already helping the community. So we've talked about your idea. We've talked about your motivation. I've shown you that you can get the skills and find the tools. And if you work inside a large organization, maybe that's good enough. Maybe you can then build that prototype and get that funding within that organization. But if you're building something on your own, you don't have that. And so how are you going to go from having that prototype you've just built to having the funds to build finished product? Well, that's where crowdsourcing comes in. Kickstarter, the largest of the crowdsourcing sites, I prefer the term community funding, um, 
Kickstarter in 2012 had over 2 million people contribute to projects. They gave over $300 million and 17 projects raised more than a million dollars. Some of you may even have backed some of those projects or have some of those products. It's really exciting and it's really neat to see people take their idea and their passion, build that prototype, go on Kickstarter, and then get the funding to bring their idea all the way to reality. But there's something else really, really cool that happens when you go through this process. And I've talked to a number of people who've all had the same effect, but they didn't see it coming. And that effect is a really, really cool benefit to your personal and your professional life. Creativity, critical thinking, learning are all skills. And the more you exercise them, the better you get. So if you're out trying to figure out how to make something, and you're on the weekend learning these new tools and figuring out how to bring your ideas to life, that's going to have a professional benefit for you as well. You don't go to work and suddenly stop being as creative or leave that knowledge behind, right? Those skills are going to pay off. And I want to talk really quickly about two people that I've met that I think are really good examples of this. So the first, Eben Upton on the far left. Eben is the individual who had the original idea for the Raspberry Pi. What he wanted to do was put computers back in the hands of kids that were their own computers. They were inexpensive. He grew up like I did in the 8-bit age, where we all had our Commodore 64s or our Ataris, or in his case, the BBC Micro, right? And he knows that as a kid, when you own it, you experiment with it in a different way than when it's mom and dad's $2,000 MacBook. But he couldn't quite figure out how to make it happen until he ended up working at Broadcom. And it turns out one of the chips that Broadcom makes for set-top boxes could be used as the CPU in a $35 computer. So he goes and convinces Broadcom to let him build a thousand. You know, they normally sell to people who buy millions of chips. Broadcom agrees he's going to build a thousand. Word gets out, well, maybe he's going to build 10,000. Next thing you know, it goes crazy. They've now sold more than 1.5 million Raspberry Pis, many of them for education, many of them for hobbyist projects. Broadcom now pays Eben to run the Raspberry Pi Foundation and to drive those educational goals that he set out. I've had the fortune of meeting Eben, uh, Gordon, who's their head of software engineering at the top right, and Liz, uh, Eben's wife, who runs their social media for the foundation. They are great people, and it's really amazing to see them able to execute their vision and still have that benefit to Broadcom, who's helping make it all possible. Another individual, a little closer to home, this is Mike King. Uh, Mike was also on that Space Apps Challenge. Hi, Mike. Um, Mike works for the Orlando Science Center now, but that's a recent thing. Mike's the exhibit designer for the Orlando Science Center. He now has a job where he gets to build amazing things that inspire adults and kids to continue their learning of science. That's a pretty cool gig. Well, Mike got that gig because he was a member of Famalab, and he was already helping us teach Arduino at the Science Center. Next thing you know, Science Center has an opening for an exhibit designer. That's pretty cool, huh? So, great job, Mike. So, I've talked to you about your big idea, and I've talked to you about how your motivation and learning those skills and those tools and how you can find the resources for it, right? But I want to go back to my original premise, was that anyone can make amazing things. And I want you to imagine for a second that if you're making amazing things and you're learning and you're growing, you're getting more creative and you're working in the communities and you're helping that community grow, imagine what we could all do if all of us were building amazing things and growing and learning and sharing with each other at the same time. That's going to have a huge benefit for us, a huge benefit for our workforce, a huge benefit for our community, a huge benefit for our space program, whatever it is. And so that's my big idea. Now, a quick plug. I do hope to see you at Orlando Mini Maker Fair on October 5th. I'd like you to come out and see what our community is already capable of. And I'd really like to get you out to either Famalab or the Melbourne Makerspace so that you can see what these groups are doing and building amazing things every single day. Thank you.